right, man. Here it comes. Let's, here it comes. Coming right down the pipe. Welcome right down the pipe. It is, uh, what is it, May 18th, the year 2023. Welcome aboard, everybody. You're listening to the Crushing Iron Podcast, episode 686. Yes, it is. And uh, you got me, what? You got big plans for episode 700? Like we can have a cake or something? Oh, 700? <laughs> yeah. 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 You know, we got uh, the, the, the every 100 is like our milestone. See, that's 14 podcasts. So we might be at uh, Nashville Camp. Maybe we could do it. Oh, do it there live. We go. Yeah. From it's Boost right. Fitness. People. I love it. The people that we love, who that we appreciate, quite a few of our listeners. Uh, and for those listeners specifically, if it's your first time tuning in today, welcome. We appreciate you giving us your time. We know you have quite a lot of options in the Triathlon Podcast Universe and just podcasts in general. Times of time is very valuable, so we appreciate you tuning in today. We cover it all. We'll, we do swim, bike, and run specific podcasts. We do race recaps and also a lot of race previews. But for the most part, Mike and I as coaches, athletes, best friends – we just sit back, relax, have an open, honest discussion about what we're going through in life, not just as human beings, but also as coaches and athletes ourselves. We also talk frequently about what our own athletes are going through. Mike and I work with a wide range of athletes all across the globe, from beginner-level triathletes, looking at the very first 5K or sprint triathlon, all the way up through elite-level amateurs trying to get back to the world championships and everyone in between from all over the globe. Then we use the feedback loop we have with them and training peaks, emails, text messages, and the like to drive the discussion of the day we also utilize our amazing facebook group you can search that crushing iron group answer one simple question we'll let you right in awesome people fantastic community solid resource in a uh, sport that's oftentimes way over complicated with tons of confusing information out there is a uh, solid space to get quality intel and all your favorite swim bike and run specific questions from a lot of great people so don't be a lurker participate if you got a question ask it you get a lot of great feedback we'll go in there once a month or in and around there and do a q a take the pulse of the community answer as many questions as we can but that's it no sponsors no ads one agenda and that's to do our best to keep you happy and healthy in your endurance sports journey yeah, and on top of Crushing Iron Group, we have Crushing Iron Facebook page. I guess we have two. And uh, go ahead and get in the other one, too, because I guess that helps us market better to you or something. Yeah, it's not a group. It's just a page. Yeah, I think <laughs> it's, it's a like page. Tri- we can, yeah, we can send you more crap. <laughs> yeah, go like, our, go like our C26 Triathlon Facebook page. I, uh, yeah, I, uh, you know, I have, that's, I have a soft you, spot I for marketing. Listen, you and I suck at stuff like that. And you know what? I'm happy that we do. I am uh, too, man. We, yeah. I'm not on Instagram. I'm not on Twitter. I really don't have any uh, desire to be on any of those. I'm only really on Facebook because of our active athlete page. Um, you know, you went I, through, yeah, you went through recovery for that, for alcohol. For and I'm not. Huh? <laughs> Every, uh, no, I'm going, you went, <laughs> went through recovery for that. Like, you know, my social media addiction. No, not that one. But like... Uh, for uh, alcohol recovery, and, and mine is marketing. Yeah. I'm in, I'm in uh, a you're the anti marketing recovery. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. I, I worked for a news station for so long. I was a marketing director, and when I left there, now it's like I had to. <laughs> I felt like I should have gone into some kind of therapy when I left there. Like whoa, yeah. and now like we talk about my uh, insidious tactics that I used back in the day in the early 2000s, right around the beginning of the internet now that's commonplace and like everybody in their own world mm-hmm. uses those tactics and it's like infiltrating the world and i it really hey. kind of hits me in a in a weird way the hey, you are not that man anymore you can forgive yourself it's okay <laughs> <laughs> it's okay uh-huh. first step forgiving forgiving yourself uh but no <laughs> did i tell you that i had it real quick because it's kind of an interesting story i said something yeah. on facebook once and the main anchor at my old station in nashville he's like the biggest anchor in town or whatever came onto my facebook page and said mike if you feel guilty about what you used to do don't blame that on me i was like dude what the uh, it was mueller it was mueller yeah he Shocker. came at me hard man i was like dude <laughs> And then everybody, like all my friends, just started lambasting him on the Facebook feed. It was like this big ordeal. I was like, what? Get out of my face with that. 
Yeah, I'm there. I had your back. I didn't say anything, but <laughs> you yeah. wanted to. <laughs> I wanted to big time. How many you times you go back to that and look at it and go, man, this is, oh, maybe I, I should dude, just say I, this. You're writing typed, shit out on the side. <laughs> I typed it out a hundred comments, and then I went. I played the I played the Herm the Herm Edwards you know uh, favorite line. You know, after Sleep his on Jets it. Lost. He was like, yeah, don't hit send. Don't hit send. Don't <laughs> hit. <laughs> Send. Don't oh, yeah. send people. Or like my buddy Roger does whenever he gets to that point, he just pulls a picture of his dog up and posts it and just walks away. <laughs> That's actually brilliant. It is brilliant. And he goes, and every time he does that, I call him. I'm like, you're all right, man. <laughs> Cause I know the code. Like, you know the code. It's like yeah. if I ever started posting like, you know, inspirational quotes day after day after day. <laughs> That's true, man. <laughs> like, oh bro, my hey, gosh. On a bigger. Should we grab some bet. lunch? <laughs> yeah, more, that's right. Yeah, and more more serious topics, as you can tell, we are about as serious as it gets. But it is uh, it is race season, and while plenty of our topics and podcasts will cover the specifics of either uh, races themselves or training or race strategy, one of the oftentimes not talked about um, skills is how to deal with your inner voice. And this is something that we've talked about, uh, you know, I'd probably see on 20 or 30 podcasts. I mean, going back years of, um, and I think, we, I think we even have, you know, titles that are very similar to this, but I had, I had an athlete send me, uh, kind of, a, a, a I don't know, an email from another company, but it was about they would, the title was listen to Kobe, which is obviously why they sent it because I'm a huge Kobe Bryant fan. But the, the title was listen to Kobe and spend time alone in your head. And so I, re- I read the whole thing about Kobe, at least, because that's really all I care about. And I found it incredibly um, important, but also a topic that is so on time in terms of the racing season is here. You got, you know, got tons. We got, I think, 50 athletes just in our team racing this weekend. Every, you know, most people who listen to this podcast have a race probably within five, six, seven, eight weeks. And everybody's very concerned about, you know, what helmet do I wear? What's the water temperature? Can I get a new wetsuit? You know, what kind of wheels are you doing? Are you doing latex tubes? What PSI are you running? You know, are you doing nutrition? Are you going to go, you know, with uh, heavy carbohydrates? Are you going with one bottle? Are you going to go even out through a few bottles? Are you in the on-course nutrition? Have you seen the new course maps? How many turns? Has anybody checked out the road construction? I heard that it's kind of smoothly paved this year, but I'm not really sure. It's been tons of flats in the last year. Is it a rolling start or is it a wave start? All these questions surrounding these, these finite details about the race that honestly – very little and very few of them, if any, will dictate your performance more than your mental preparation and your ability to, to give effort and execute on race day. Those that, that That's our motto, right? When you talk about how to get the best race out of you, because you really don't know what's going to happen. And, and most athletes go into a race and they we all think the world cares, right? The world knows it's race day for us. So the world is going to shine its gleaming light upon us with glitter and sunshine and allow our best fitness, our best legs, our best aerobic capacity, and our best mental mindset. And we are going to crush today because you want to know why? It's race day and mm-hmm. I deserve it. But that is not how it plays out ever. It's not how it plays out. You never know what you're going to wake up with. But the only things that you can control are your effort and your execution. And effort comes first, execution comes later. Because if you don't apply the effort, you cannot execute. And the 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 mental mindset and something that we've said, I think quite a few times, and you and I talked about it before, um, you know, before the podcast is, you know, we we've said, and I've said specifically that the last few years that people have gotten weaker, not physically weaker, but mentally and emotionally weaker, more incapable or incapable of dealing with their own thoughts and their own mind. And on race day, that is the time when you are left with nothing but your own, your own mind, your thoughts, your negotiating, uh, you know, you're, you're nego- basically you're, ne- you're learning your negotiating skills with yourself. And so before we kind of get rolling in, I want to give kind of uh, some context, but the, the quote from Kobe is, is how do you negotiate how do you negotiate with yourself? That is the biggest thing. And then it shares a, a quick a quick story um, about when he was a, a coach for a practice. And it says, um, but what struck me most when hearing Bryant discuss his own internal process is the lesson he tried to teach the youth basketball team he was coaching at the time. And he says, we were running uh, line drills at practice. I had a parent who was encouraging his daughter, you can do it, dig deep. 
Brian explained. Mm. After practice, he pulled that parent aside and said, when she's doing those line drills, don't say anything. Because there's a conversation that's happening inside her head. She's talking to herself, pumping herself up to do it. So for an outside voice to come in and give her the guidance and the push to keep going, it actually interrupts her process. Let her be, let her figure it out herself. And that is a lost art Mm. these days. We have so much distraction and opportunities for motivation in our face from music, from screens, from, you know, uh, motivational quotes on the, whatever it is, guess how much of that'll be there on race day? Zero. Nothing. Nothing. And, and it's one of those things like that. One of the initial conversations I have with tons of our athletes that, Hey, you know, what kind of, and if they listen to this podcast, they already know, but you know, they say, you know, what is the, you know, are you, I, I'm going to need, you know, some external motivation. I, I kind of need, you know, a pick me up or a kick in the ass, you know, it's some, that's not me. And it's not because I don't care. It's because I want you to figure it out on your own. I've said that plenty of times to athletes. Hey, I, I can't, I, I don't, I'm not feeling like working out today. You know, do you have any, you know, words to me? Yeah. Figure it out. Figure it out. Have the conversation in your head. <laughs> figure it out. That, yeah, figure it out. Like, figure out why you're making that excuse, right? Why you're deciding to sleep in, why you're deciding to pull back an interval, you know, why you're choosing, you know, a drive through in Wendy's versus going home and making the meal you already prepped. Figure out why, why you're asking those things, why you're making excuses, excuses, why you're, ex, you know, deciding to do easier things than hard things. And when I say hard things, I'm talking about impossible things because a hard thing might be to just bypass Wendy's and go, go home and made your, you know, your pre made chicken and rice. That's a hard thing, right? Passing up having six cookies instead of one when you really want some extra ones. Like those are hard decisions, right? Hard's relative. Because when it comes to race day, and we we've talked about and I, I think I've used it, you know, the the um you know the the you know or the the Jan Ferdino is one of perfect one, you know, the Tuesday afternoon world championship world champion. You got athletes that are, you know, are are their game day ready, right? They are they're all about game day, their mental aspect is there, even if the training hasn't been there. And then you have the, you know, the ones that, you know, I call practice pads. They're all, they can nail practice when it comes to game day. They don't have it. And it all, it 100% comes down to your inability or ability to negotiate with yourself inside your head because it's going to be self-doubt. It's going to be, it's going to be more self-doubt than it will be anything else. So how do you navigate that? How do you overcome those? And then more specifically, are you even providing yourself opportunities to go out and do that in practice and not expecting yourself to be able to dig deep on race day? Because if your definition of just having to do it, you got music every workout, you got distractions every workout, you don't take time to, you know, to have inner dialogue and, and listen to yourself, have negative self-talk and then overcome it. Well, in order to dig deep on race day, your, your dig deep is going to be about a half a centimeter. Yeah. Because you haven't, because it's true, because you haven't done the work in practice and in training to challenge yourself and figure out that digging deep really means digging a trench about 12 feet deep. And I think, again, with racing season here, if you want the best out of yourself, you know how to get, you need to know how to get every ounce out of yourself. And that goes, and that's all from the chin up. Yeah, for sure, dude. I got, before I got some thoughts on that, I, it just kind of made me laugh a little bit. I remember to, Start with that figure it out part. Uh, I came uh, when I was living in Nashville. I came back and I was visiting Beloit, and a friend of mine had just taken over this uh, like a manufacturing plant. He was the plant manager, so he's kind of a big deal at this place. And uh, and I had a sweet ass office, and I went in there, and we were hanging out in there probably for a good hour, just talking about sports and basketball, and you know, just kind of you know, here he's the plant manager and. I'm just sitting there and we're just shooting the shit in his big mahogany desk and all that stuff. <laughs> and somebody knocked on the door and it was like the line guy or something. He came in and goes, Hey Jim, we got the uh, problem. This thing is going on and we can't figure it. You know, can't, this is broke and uh, this. And he goes, hang on a second, Mike. He goes, figure it out. <laughs> 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 and he goes, so true. <laughs> and, uh, anyway, uh, but yeah, the, uh, digging deep, man, I, that reminded me of, uh, Last year, actually, a chat, 70.3, I was coaching a guy named Brian Leverett, and he, he's a really good athlete, and he was coming around for the second loop, and it was really hot, and I could tell, you know, he's kind of a bigger guy, stronger guy, and 
I could tell it was really starting to get to him. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I, I don't know why, but I was standing on the second loop start there, you know, when they go through that little area up there. And, um, and I, I looked at him and I said, dig deep. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, I don't know why, but like, it just kind of went away. But then uh, like a few days later, he emailed me and he goes, I gotta say, man, that kind of just made me laugh. <laughs> he said that. And, uh, but it's so true, man. I've been, uh, uh, back in a little bit in training and I actually, uh, this topic is kind of on point for me right now because I, I remember yesterday I was out running <clears throat> and I've been running a lot more and feeling pretty good about it. And I remember thinking, I was like, shit, I don't have my headphones in. And I haven't been. Mm. And I was like, at that moment, because I know <clears throat> it's better to do it without them. I mean, there's no question that music is an adrenaline burst and, and it helps you go. But Proven. 100%. And I like it a lot. But what I've been running, lately I've been running and I've been having these internal negotiations with my form. And I've been really thinking about pace and, and about breathing. And when you're, when you're not listening to music, it's a hell of a lot easier to know when you're getting out of, you know, your zone. Um, and, and I've been really paying attention to that and slowing down. I think we talked about this on a cast a while ago, how about how to love running. If you don't love running, if you're not loving it, you're probably going too fast. Or you're, yeah, you're doing it wrong. You're, yeah, you're doing it wrong. So I've really been paying attention to this idea of trying to make running easier and easier on my you know body and just kind of staying within myself. And it's really been, it's been kind of awesome actually to pay attention to that sort of stuff where even I'll, I'll just like slow down and walk for about 10 steps and sort of recalibrate because <clears throat> you know, you get out, you, you start pushing and you can do it, but that's, it really starts to um, take you off your game. You know what I mean? I mean, it's it's one thing to run hard when you're supposed to be running hard, but if you're trying to t keep it cool and keep it easy, and a lot of people have <clears throat> issues with staying in zone two, me included, and I've kind of gotten to the point where, um, you know, I've, I've I've been thinking more about like the knees and high knees and 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 picking things up and and running quieter things like that. You know, not slapping the foot. Because I think this, this thought crossed my mind, and maybe you can confirm it, but I think one of the problems with a high heart rate in zone two running or trying to get it down to zone two is, is that we land too hard. It's almost like the body has to push up too much weight. Does that make sense? It's almost like going uphill a little bit, even if you're on a flat. You know, it's like if you're landing hard and pushing off hard, I feel like that gets your heart rate up. And oh, like the, yeah, maybe not exactly like that, but I, I know that for athletes, when they, they say they are in more, it hurts them to run slower than it does to run faster. Mm -hmm. and, and that is because there is significantly more ground contact time, right? Because they're, they're not running mo more, they're not running their normal cadence. They're staying on the ground longer because their, their stride is, their stride is, is shorter and more pronounced. And so they're on the, they're on the ground, they're landing harder on themselves, which is again, what happens to most people on race day. Um, so I, I get, I get what you're saying right there. One of the things that you said that I wanted to, that I wanted to touch on that I think is, um, incredibly important, but also a great reminder for, for athletes is that, you know, there's, there's nothing wrong with music, right. Or, cheering right or having that extra little bit but you and I'm, I'm gonna give you a compliment here so don't get all awkward on me <laughs> but you are one of the more you're one of the better gamers that i know when it comes to showing up on race day Thank you. right and and, and and you you've always and i know you you know just as good as anybody especially from a uh a, a training perspective i i would say in the last seven eight years you probably ran with headphones less than 20 percent of the time yeah, I don't think I don't think you've ever ridden outside with headphones ever. No, that's not true. I go to the lab. Well, I used to go to the lab. I would. You go to the lab. You put them in. But I, I also knew know you as a guy to be to sit out on your trainer in the garage and listen to music and stare at nothing. Mm -hmm. Right, stare at nothing. Right. So you 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 put that and you always talk about it and you've talked about it openly on on the podcast and the, and it's and it's a fascinating 
to to kind of go back and think about it and, and then read this about, you know, if you need that extra, there's nothing, again, there's nothing wrong with, you know, caffeine or extra motivation with music or cheering to get you out the door on race day or to get that extra little bit out of you. But when you are accustomed to it, right, you hop on Zwift and everybody's liking your ride and chatting and you got it, go ahead. When you get on race day, you specifically always talk about, I kind of just feel like the crowd can get me the, give, give me that extra little push. Hmm. Yeah, the extra push to get going, and to me that doesn't <clears throat> happen to a lot of people because they're so used to having external motivation and everything that they do, right? Music in their ears in the pool is their favorite playlist, proven to boost performance and make you make not not make you do better, but will will probably keep in the pool longer. Everybody's on an indoor trainer now with all these kind of gadgets, riding Swift or trainer road or courses and music and friends and chats. And it's like, it, it's honestly more social networking than it is riding your bike inside. You do none of that. Right. And then you got running. A lot of people still run inside on a treadmill or do these things or, or, or want to have music or, or talk on the phone. It's like, so when you get on race day, you don't get that extra chill, right? The chills on the arms, right? Yeah. A lot of people get you don't get the extra boost of the spectators of the music bumping in the morning that's just pumping you up because you know what? You're used to it. Just like caffeine, right? But a lot of people say, you know, wean yourself off caffeine a little bit, you know, leading up to a race. That way when you use it in a race, you really get – because caffeine's a drug, mm. right? Anything you wean yourself off a drug, you go back on it again. It just has like, you know, a, a pronounced effect. <clears throat> and on race day, if, you know, using that to your advantage is huge, Right. So you you do you want to kind of have that again? It, it maybe maybe it's I think it's something to be explored. Maybe cycle through it, like go through, you know, your first 12, eight, 16 weeks of your big training block with, you know, with with all music, right? Getting out the door, making you the hard work, and then the last you know three to four weeks of the training block, go dark, right? No social media, no music when you ride, no screen, just work. Mm-hmm. Goes outside. Just sound familiar? Yeah, because it's just like race day, right? You're alone on race day, only in your head for not just an hour and a half on the trainer, but from five to eight hours alone. It's, let's see, I want you to think about this for a minute. I'm thinking, and, and, and I'm just not talking about when we train, right? You're standing in line in a coffee shop. What do you do? Get out your phone, mm -hmm. right? Walk to the. I, I guarantee you, six billion text messages are are sent while people sit on the toilet every single day. For sure, every single day, everyone picks up their phone all the time. For no one is alone with the thoughts. So I'm not talking about. I, I would argue that when a person goes out for a 70.3 or, or an Ironman bike ride, they are in their head more without social media or, you know, or some kind of a media driven distraction for more time on that ride than they will have at all in the previous three months. Easy to uh, collectively easily because most people couldn't tell you the last time they went eight hours, six hours, five hours, three hours straight without their phone. Yeah. You can't. Everyone's got it, even on the training. And so I, I do think it would be, I mean, I think it would be fascinating to have athletes do that kind of, not, not really a study, but do that kind of like, yeah, you know, get the music, get out there, get your fitness where you need to be, do what you need to do. But when it comes closer to, to race day, don't do, you know, race day simulations physically, do them mentally. Perfect fueling, perfect mindset. You don't need the extra. Figure it out because you're going to have to figure it out on race day. You have to figure it out. You got to find a way to get it done. And you can only do that by having continual conversations with yourself. Know yourself, know what you're going to say next, know how to combat it, know how to overcome it, or you're going to give in. And I do. I think that like that game day feeling, the people that can produce the most are the ones that probably are the most that that do they get that big boost from the crowd, from the music, from the race venue, from the fact that it's a race? A lot of people are like, yeah, that's just like an everyday Tuesday for me, and I just can't figure out why I can't, you know, take that extra step or make that extra, you know, uh, jump in power or make that next group or swim a little bit harder. I get so, I just got off my game when someone ran into me in the in the first like second buoy. It just really threw me off. 
what? Mm. What? Like, do th- again, like it, it, it was, we spend 90% of triathletes waste every minute of their research on things that won't affect their race day at all instead of doing what they need to do to get better. It might be hard to hear. Sorry, but it's true. Take all the minutes and hours you spend perusing and asking ridiculous questions in these closed Ironman Facebook groups, most of which can be found in the athlete guide if you would just read it. Take those and go into mental preparation. Mental warfare is exactly what it is. You against you. Mental warfare. And most people lose on race day. They don't lose the, to the people in their age group. They don't lose to their fitness. They don't lose to the conditions. You lose to yourself. You lose to yourself. You give up. You cave in. You slow down. You choose to walk. You mail it in. You find an excuse. You want to know why? Because you're not used to having to negotiate. Right? Watch the negotiator. That should be everyone's pre, pre, uh, <laughs> pre Iron Man seventy point three races. The Samuel L. Jackson old school negotiator was up like nineteen ninety something. Watch that, Kevin Spacey. Be a be the best negotiator you can be with yourself to get the best result out. Don't don't cave in and give up immediately. But again, in order to do that, you got to practice it. Go one more minute, you know, just to show yourself. Right? Not every time, but occasionally. Right? Why do you want to stop? Because it feels easier. Yeah, so it'll feel easier for right now, but then in 30 minutes, are you going to go back and regret that minute you shaved off? 100%. And you can't go back and get it. Mm. Man, this is uh, really feeling good to me right now. <laughs> the compliments. No, but seriously, like uh, I have athletes that will write, they'll go to the pool and, you know, you know I, I check the comment and it says, the absolute worst, awful, terrible, this is a... People in my lane, the water aerobics kept ball kept coming in or whatever. And I and I look at what they did that day and I say, That is awesome. And they're like, What? What do you mean? I sucked. My my form was off. I couldn't do shit. I was slow. Water was hot. And I was like, Yeah, but that's really good practice for a race, man. And you not, and you know, in the end there's like thirty four hundred yards in there too, right? That it sucked. The whole thing was terrible. They didn't swim fast and they felt terrible and but they got 3,400 and I was like, yeah, that's practice right there. You have to negotiate your way through that kind of stuff. And it's not the exact same thing, but it's all those little problems that you create Mm -hmm. that you have to figure out. And we talk about all the time. I'm glad you brought that. I forgot I said that, but yeah, I talked about race energy. Like I count on about 20% race energy, which is probably why I sucked at Wisconsin last year because there was nobody out there because the weather was so shitty and it was raining the whole time. Still, you, I guarantee you, this is not a shot at you. This is just the facts. I bet you, of all the people that finished that race, I bet you less than 5% of them trained less than you did. Oh, probably very, Serious? very likely. <laughs> I mean, and, and I guarantee you, I, and honestly, I'd be willing to bet, I'd, I'd bet 500 bucks. I bet 500 bucks that every person that DNF'd trained more than you did. <laughs> Seriously. Well, yeah. I, I bet 500, I put, I'll put a thousand on it. Awesome. I bet you every single person that DNF'd at Wisconsin trained more than you. And I, I know, I know I said it in kind of a jest and probably came out the wrong way, but whatever is I remember, I think I remember saying this in the bus stop as it's pouring down rain, it's fucking cold and no one wants to be out there in Wisconsin. And I remember thinking to myself, so how are those track Tuesdays working out for you right about now? <laughs> Cause they probably never made it off the bike. And it's just, it's, it's such a, it is a, it's just, it's true. And, and again, it's like, it goes back to one of those things where, you can be as fit as you want to be, but if you're mentally weak or you haven't done the mental work and the mental training and, and been a part of that internal mental warfare, then doesn't your fitness doesn't matter. It don't matter on the perfect day, right? You're, you're the perfect pat, the practice pat. It'll, it, it matters then because there, there are no layered in obstacles. But if you want to be a gamer, not a trainer, you better get your head right. You better get your mind right. And you can't do that from always looking outward the tough part is having that conversation inward, right? Same goes for, for us in life, right? Everyone spends the majority of their time complaining, blaming, right? Stop bringing me problems, bring me solutions. Yeah. And that goes with the, the internal talk you have about yourself. Because the hardest look you'll ever have in life, the hardest look, the deepest look, 
the most painful look will be the one in the mirror. You know, what, what are you failing at? What do you need to work on? What can you do about it? Instead of blaming everybody else or I really need this to happen or I can't believe they did that or this, they're, this, they're, you know, playing the victim card 24 seven. What are you doing about it? Mm-hmm. Figure it out. Figure it out. Right. Yeah. I had this conversation with an athlete, I think last week. And, you know, one of my, I think my, you know, one of the quotes you introduced me to way back in the day is, you know, what matter what matters most is how well you walk through the fire. Mm-hmm. Everyone can be a victim of something, but feeling victimized every day beyond that is a choice. You can turn that into fuel because every day you wake up, this is, this is exactly what I said to her. I was going through some real difficult professional stuff and people were, were treating her poorly and going behind her back and doing things. And I just said, I said, listen, I said, I said, I know it, it sounds hard. But every day you wake up and do it again and deal with it the right way, the more strength you gain and the weaker they become. Because you're not just proving to yourself that you can do hard things, that you can handle hard things, but you're showing them that it's not going to phase you. So as the distance grows between your work with their company and your work with your new company, after the dust settles, they'll realize that they've actually become weaker Right by trying to do these things to make you weaker, they've actually become weaker because it hasn't worked, and they've done things that have you know aren't going to shine very light, you know, uh, shine a good light on themselves, and you're going to have become stronger, and that stuff is irreplaceable if you wake up and do it, if you choose to not let it keep you down, if you choose to go to battle every day, or you can choose to be a doormat and walk be walked all over. Or you can choose to get up. And again, these are all conversations people have with themselves on race day. Do I quit? Do I self-sabotage? Do I push forward? What do I do? Do I make excuses? Well, I did have that injury back, you know, like six of months ago. And, you know, I missed that you know, a couple of weeks of training and, and whatever. And, and, you know, it's like, it's kind of like I said on a Zoom call yesterday, you know, should I be concerned about, you know, losing fitness over this next week? And I said, well, unless you can tell me exactly the fitness that you have or had, you can't tell me how much you lost. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, it's, it's just a fact. Right? It's, 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 am, am I going to lose much fitness? Am I going to lose much fitness? I'm like, unless you can tell me specifically exactly how much total fitness, overall health and fitness you had, then you can't tell me you're going to lose any because you don't have a number. But it, it, again, going back to, to race day and that mental warfare is like doing hard things, being put in those situations is a blessing. It's a blessing. If you look at it as, you know, the obstacle is the way. If you look at it as an opportunity to gain strength instead of act weak, which is most people's default. Act weak, act like you've been done wrong, act like it's somebody else's fault. Instead, look at it as an obstacle and say, you know what? I'm about to fucking get this done and then do it. And who gives that strength? You. Who does it take, who does it take strength away from? Anybody else or maybe no one else who cares because it's all about you. So you've got to practice that stuff. You can't practice the easy and expect to do hard things, right? It's not do easy. And then on one day, do hard things. You're gonna be like, what? This says this, this feels really difficult. And they're like, this is like medium, medium level difficult right here. Yeah. If you want to do hard things. If you want to, you know, do the impossible or overcome challenges or find the squeak every ounce of or inch out of yourself with the best. Like you got to be prepared to go there. And you can't just wake up on race day and decide to do it. You got to prepare to do it. Yeah. Well, a good example of that. The other day I went down to Del Boca Vista. And I've done this many times. It's happened to me just because I'm super unorganized with packing stuff. And I got out and I was going to go for a nice little trail run. And I I didn't have any socks. All I had was, uh, for some reason, those like knee-high wool ski socks that I wore when I went skiing. (laughs) It's like super thick socks and i'm like man this is not ideal but i put them on it was uncomfortable and i kind of sort of relish in those moments when that happens like if i don't have exactly the right shit with me or whatever i'm like it's kind of back to that figure it out how you gonna how you gonna figure it out i was uh last week we had some 70.3s and usually you know i try to talk to athletes before the race um at the bigger races and um 
everyone I had I think three of them last week and I went through it and then the, we you know we went through everything from the beginning of the race to transition to cool down and you know cool down at every aid station the whole nine yards and pacing and everything and then we were getting about ready to get up and I said oh or hang up I'd be I said one thing one last thing I was like yeah don't forget that this is going to be hard as fuck and how are you going to handle it because I don't care how well you've trained it's all relative if you're racing hard, if you're going to go after it, you could be in the best shape of your life. This is not going to be easy. It shouldn't be because that's what racing is, right? You know, you got to get to a certain level. And at you no know, invariably, at some point in that run, it's going to really suck. So that's what are you going to do then? You know, how are you going to get through that? You know, you got to understand that just because you're not, you know, out on your 40-minute run with strides in the middle of the week and it feels unbelievable you're not going to feel like that at the end of the race most likely unless you're superhuman or something happened but or you left some you know you took it easy all the day and then you had it left but for the most part at the end what are you going to say to yourself when (laughs) it's mile you know nine you got four miles left and your legs are your hips are aching and your feet hurt and it's hot and you're sweating and you're what are you going to do then you know, and you got this. Yeah, you got this, you man. Got this. You got it. You know, with, I with your wool leggings. Yeah, <laughs> knee high wool. <laughs> but seriously, though, I mean, I, I just, I, I do kind of like, like that stuff. And you know, you talk about how I used to ride, and I still do it. I ride in the garage on my trainer a lot, mm-hmm. and I used to do that in Nashville in the summer, training for Wisconsin or Chattanooga or something like that, and I would set up my trainer in my little dilapidated garage and open the door and I'd stare at an above ground pool for four hours. (laughs) Just like bake in there. But like you're sad, man, it's like the stuff you go through during that, if you're not distracted is like, it makes it seem easy. Mm -hmm. I mean, you you've been there. I mean, that's the thing you have to create similar situations, right? I mean, obviously, we talk about how the more you race, the better you're going to probably be, at least, you know, all things, you know, equal with training and everything, because you have the experience, you've been through it, you know how to negotiate and get through certain situations. But how you do it in training, <clears throat> there's a lot of opportunities, man. Make it harder. You know, I, I'm not saying kill yourself, but, you know, there's, there's a lot of things we can do. And, you know, we had, uh, you know, we talked about just one more, you know, and figure out how to get one more out of you. That, like that process alone is a, is a valuable mental exercise of getting to the next, you know, one more mile, one more mile, whatever it is. <clears throat> Just do it. Just try it. Feel it. Fail. You know, get beat up. Get shelled once in a while in training. Just to feel it and get through it. You know, everything's not going to go smooth. You know, and that's the thing. Is like I, I think sometimes I, I don't know. But like an athlete will say something along that lines, like it just went to shit as the worst ever. I, mean, I don't know if they're like, sometimes I'll probe them. I'll be like, is that a bad thing? Or I mean, like, are you really bummed out right now? Or are you trying to figure it out? Why it went wrong? You know, like that, getting to the bottom of it. I mean, that becomes kind of part of the fun, really. It should be. That's the process, right? You know, but we get you know, so trapped in the idea that everything should be glitzy and shiny and feel great. But it's those moments when you're going through it and how do you get out of it? You know, that, that to me becomes part of the enjoyment. It's sort of maybe a little masochistic on some level, but whatever, you know, that's part of sports. I think just in general, it's like, cause there's many, many times when you could just throw in the towel and roll over, but the people who don't roll over are usually the ones that come out on top. And I think even layering in opportunities that are readily available to quit is also a good thing. Yeah. Like I remember back in the day when we used to train at the lab all the time. Again, it's a, the lab was a abandoned. Well, it used to be abandoned air field. Now it's a place where people walk their dogs and do wedding shoots. But back in the day when it was the pristine lab that we, that we, that we know and love, it was, it's 1.2 miles asphalt basically a track bike track with no tree coverage straight sunshine tons of wind and you had to and i i had to i had to drive there and park so yours a little bit harder but i remember 
So I'd spend hours and hours and hours out there. You knew what you're going to get. You knew it was going to suck. <laughs> you knew you're going to tailwind one way, hell, headwind the other way. It was going to be hot. At some point, it's going to be boring as hell. And just over to the side is your car. Yeah, right there. Where you can, and you you live what like a, you live like what a mile away. Yeah, yeah. It's right there. Just just peel on over on your next lap. And you you it's like uh, you know everybody complains about the you know, when you have to do the second loop and it goes right by the finish line. Mm-hmm. That's like the lab every one mile. Yeah, <laughs> and I remember true. the day that I did a century out there. I've done seventy five out there. I've done eighty out there. That was the most mentally tough I've ever been, is because every single time you're uncomfortable, it was just that easy, right? Because it's become very acceptable to accept excuses. Like we're supposed to be all soft now. They're like, ah, oh, you should just live and fight another day, man. You got this. And sometimes it's true, but the, the fact that at some point you got to figure out a way to push through because you might not have the next day, right? Mm-hmm. That, might, that, that, that might be race day. Right. So what are you going to do, right? You know, or, or do, you know, I remember I used to do like, I think my long run is like 18 and a half miles on the treadmill. Just listening to music, looking at nothing. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I don't, I don't, you know, suggest that for everyone, but I, but I will say that like, that was around again, like the, the time where I was so mentally tough because I, you, all you gotta do is hop off, just step off yeah, and you're done. Have the showers. It's good to go. Feel good. You know, it's providing yourself opportunities to where you can just cave and, and mail it in and be done. And that's why, you know, I think again, like layering in opportunities and figuring it out and, and providing opportunities to, to, to push beyond your limits because you got to have those conversations, right? And in, in, in order to figure out what, you, what your mind's going to say, you know, and do that. And on race day, you know, it's just like there's, there's this endless com- – is there going to be words and phrases and sentences and tactics that you've, you're not used to, you've never heard before because you haven't gone through it. You haven't trained for it. And that's just a huge – again, a huge piece. I've never in my life heard an athlete – finish a race that did well and they just say you know what i just didn't have it mentally today <laughs> yeah so, well just fucking rocked it pr the hell of it but just didn't have it mentally wasn't there it was chunk checked out and didn't really do it. never happens mm. never happens the best races oftentimes come from mediocre to average fitness with an exceptional result in in, in your head game I just I told myself I'd get it done, that I wouldn't give up, that I would conquer this, that I would make it happen. I was on it. Fitness might have been there, but the rest of it can take you the rest of the way. And that's that and again that goes with effort and execution. You know, most I mean the if you're if you're competing against the field in triathlon, you know, Olympic, sprint, whatever it is, seventy especially the longer you go, because the more the more mistakes you can make, is you know, in order to beat the field, you just have to you have to beat 40% of them because 60% of them will make too many, will make too many mistakes and you just got to outsmart the rest of them. That's it. But you can't outsmart them if you're, if you're not there mentally, right? And you're making bad decisions. And which is again, a lot, something that a lot of people do when they're, when they're tired, when they're not, you know, t- again, combine that weak mind, tired body, terrible decisions. Mm-hmm. That's the recipe for the drive through, <laughs> right? I'll take two double cheeseburgers, some chicken nuggets, a blizzard and a large Coke. Like no one makes that decision when they've got tons of energy. They just killed a workout. They're feeling so good about themselves and they're motivated. No one's like, yeah, I think I'll go ruin all of it with this meal that will trash my body for three days. No, you make those decisions when you're upset, you're stressed, you're tired. So you're weak, you're weak minded. So you make bad decisions and then that makes you feel physically weak for the next like two or three days. And, and then there it goes and that the vicious cycle continues, right? right? Which is hard to get people out of, but it is, it's a, as much time as again, as people spend on, you know, gear and all these things that like, again, will not, isn't going to make your, your, your race day. You make your race day. The race will give you the conditions, same conditions everybody else gets. Same conditions, uh-huh. right? And I, and I don't even tell athletes this sometimes. It's just, just stop mentioning it. Stop mentioning it. I don't need to know that your your niggle was a two on a scale of one to ten today. That's non-existent to me. It just is because it's been a two for the last six months. It hasn't gotten worse. So stop mentioning it because you're, all you're doing is giving it power. Period. 
All you're doing is giving it power. All yeah. you're doing is showing yourself that you're still focused on this one part of your run that doesn't feel kind of good. You know, is it going to get you injured? No. They just store it. Just niggle. It'll work itself out. Keep moving. Oh, I got a hangnail. Oh, I got a slight cut in the back of my heel. Okay, put some socks on, put a blister over, and get to work. Like, I mean, it's just like, it's we've, you know, my 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 power meter battery died. My Ziff software crashed. I had to do an update. My, you know, my AirPods weren't working. It was sprinkling outside, so I shifted my room. And guess what usually happens? Doesn't even rain. Just got to get it done. Mm-hmm. Make it. Like, and there's just well, yeah. way too many layered in excuses and and not enough, honestly, there's way too many available excuses and not enough people out there to hold people accountable to not use them. Yeah. We, we, I've, we go back to this a couple of times with Amelia Boone when she said, oh, yeah. I look at the calendar the next day and I pick my workout time based on when the worst weather is. <laughs> it's like, that's outstanding to me. You know, so like, uh, it's going to rain at two o'clock. Yeah. Okay. That's when I'm running or whatever. <laughs> and yeah, I, I just think there's, that's so awesome, man, to, to, look at things like that. You know, I, I always talk about too this thing. And you mentioned that two on a scale at one to 10 pain is like these niggles and stuff. And I always talk about trying to heal. Like those things pop up like constantly, you know, and that was the one thing that was interesting to me was, uh, when I first started running back when my late forties, how much it hurt, you know, like, cause I, I just hadn't really been a runner and, and the more you run, you know, the more you go through some of that shit, you know, and especially if you're not keeping up on your mobility and your, you know, body weight and strength stuff and, and yoga, whatever, that stuff kind of like, it's, it's, it's kind of part of the, the program a little bit, mm-hmm. you know? And, and so like, I always think about that, you know, like if my knee started hurting yesterday in the run a little, a little bit, you know, I was like, damn it, that kind of bothers. So I, thought, okay, that must be a sign of some sorts. And and I started trying to run lighter, like I said, or I was maybe like too much emphasis on my right side. I think that we do that a lot. Uh, if we have strong sides, we kind of, you know, lean on them a little harder. And, and over time that that's going to, you know, pain, be painful. And uh, so, yeah, I was thinking about like uh, that w- Wisconsin race again, when you're talking and uh, I mean, I like, and being smart, you know, how be, how good decision-making and, you know, being, being on top of that. And that can be, you know, that's not always like, uh, uh, you know, there can be a million things. Right. So I got, when I got off that bike last year, I was absolutely decimated. You know, I knew right then I couldn't even get off. The guy was like, here, I got it. And I'm like, dude, I just, I need a minute here. I need to, I just <laughs> stood there for like a minute oh, straddling my bar. I was like, I can't even, you know, I knew I was toast. Right. But what did I do? You know, I came out and I, I did walk through the transition and kind of got my bearings a little bit. And then I started trying to run the whole thing. And I knew that I couldn't. I mean, if I would have, if you'd asked me, you know, I think I probably thought I could, but the smart play there would have been to start off doing run walking and just kind of pace myself and really tried to see if I could pull it together. But instead I, I ran, like tried to go as far as I could. And then I got probably to what mile 14 or something. And then it was like over. But then by the mm. end, with about six miles left, I remember exactly where I was. I was on that running path up back there. And it was the first time I've ever been out there in the dark at Wisconsin because of the conditions and maybe under training, whatever. But I started doing run walk. And I think that those were some of my faster splits. <laughs> and I was like, why the fuck didn't I do that from the beginning? Because I knew I was shot. But I had, yeah. to, you know what I mean? Like, I'm not saying everybody should do that or advocate for it, but I think most people could probably benefit from some of that during an Ironman. You know what I mean? Like I'll never forget the first Ironman I went to was Louisville and I got there and watched it. I was watching. I'm like, why is everybody walking here? (laughs) It was a hundred degrees, but it was still, I was just shocked by the amount of people walking. And then uh, our friend Corey Coggins, he ended up having a really great race out of nowhere kind of. And, and he told me that he walked every aid station. I was like, what? That seems silly. Why does he mm-hmm. walk? I, Cause I, in my mind, I'm like, you just got to run it all. You got to run the whole thing. But the reality is the smart play for, I think probably half of the Ironman, out, the Ironman out there is probably mixing some run walk because you just aren't strong enough to, 
you know, blast yourself on a bike and then go run a marathon. I just don't, I just think it's reality for a lot of people. And, but my point is my smart thinking would have had a play because I ended up, I ended up walking like, you know, a half a mile at a crack or something stupid at mile 14 versus why didn't I just kind of try and find a formula that was going to work and then maybe something would click, you know, I just pushed through it with bad form and just beat the crap out of myself and I was toasted halfway through that marathon again. Yeah, I remember back to the walk run thing. I remember I think I talked about that post Ohio. What two years ago when we did it, you did the run relay and I did the the seventy point three. Mm-hmm. And I, I went past the first aid station. I went and it was so hot. I remember the dew point was like seventy five. It was just unreal, just muggy, gross, exhaust you're breathing out of a straw. And I remember I went like, I don't know, probably two meters beyond the aid station and stopped and turned around and walked backwards <laughs> and got ice and water. Cause I remember I told myself, this is not the day to try. Yeah. <laughs> raise it because you're going to, just going to fry. So you can either walk the aid station to see how well you do or, you know, and give up a minute, maybe minute, maybe a minute and a half, or you can get so hot and so dumb that you lose five. So the choice is up to you again. It all goes, it is, it's all goes back to choices and then self-talk. Like I had this, I had this discussion, not discussion, but I played doubles in a match on Sunday and the guy I was partnered with, I was, he was just moved up to the level that I'm at and he was, uh, I'd never played with him before and he was very, I wouldn't say he was negative, but he was very like everything, he never said anything good about himself and he would just kept making comments like, man, it's just so hot out here, man, it's hot today, man, it's hot today. I finally just said, stop talking about how hot it is because it's going to make all it's going to do is make you hotter. Mm. Yeah. It's and, true. and even like, you know, sometimes you may come say, I'm sorry, man. I was like, I'm just, just, you know, let's do the next one. Just have fun and get, get it right. Cause I, I talk to myself a ton when I play tennis and, you know, but it's all positive. Well, not all positive. Sometimes it's like, Hey, get your shit together. But, um, but it's the, it's not like the, you, the constant negative feedback that's like, oh man. So, cause what do you think saying that does? Doesn't make it. I I legit believe that makes you hotter. One hundred percent. I believe always talking about how hot it is makes you hotter. Always talking about how tired you are makes you more tired. Always talking about how stressed you are makes you more stressed. It's like you give breath and power to all these negative things by continuously vo- making it vocal and telling everyone. Because at some point, I mean, you gotta start. You know, your body listens to yourself. And again, you you are what you tell yourself. I'm hot. You're hot. <laughs> I'm going to relax. I'm going to take this easy. What do you do? Relax. Take it easy. So again, like we can close it out there. Start practicing, you know, not just the mental warfare, but the positive self-talk, right? The things that are affirming, not creating self-doubt, right? And put yourself in situations going into race day that are going to be like race day. Not obsessing about the helmet. You're going to drop 400 bucks unless you're going to wear three times this year. That, that that honestly more than likely isn't even going to be the best helmet for you uh, and to be more aerodynamic, but you just wear it. So spend more, spend more time in your thoughts, spend more time in your head, have those conversations. They might not be fun, but they'll be worth it. Right. They will 100% be worth it. And on race day, you will thank yourself because you'll hear the first, the first wave will come, you'll combat it. The second wave of thoughts will come and you'll have it. the second wave of negative feedback will come and you'll have it and then you'll be done. But if you don't, you're going to cave in on the very first kick in the face in the water. I'm like, oh my God. You know, it's like it just that you you did. You, I, I knew it. You, I, I just I got a little bit of a calf cramp with my wetsuit getting off. And, never, and then after that, it was just the game was over. No, the game wasn't over. You decided to go sit on the sidelines with your head and your body kept going. And you wonder why I didn't perform. Get your head right, people. No more excuses get to work and again don't look for everyone else maybe beside outside of this podcast today to, to convince you to get to work and stop making excuses and hold yourself accountable right we can't always continue to look to other people about why we aren't doing things or why this isn't happening you got to take ownership take ownership of your journey take ownership of your goals take ownership of your performance take ownership of what you want to do and just fucking go get it you can't wait go get it hope you got this podcast today as always we love you we appreciate you even even when we pull even the pulpit and get up on behind the, uh, you know, do a little bit of preaching like we did today. It's because we love you and we appreciate you. We want you to get the most out of yourself. 
And it's okay to have these hard conversations like today. Uh, go to our website, c26triathlon.com. It is our one-stop shop for all things coaching, camps, and community. And uh, if you're looking for coaching for the year, you can look, click on the coach tab and peruse the coach coaches and figure out the one that's right for you. If you're looking for ways to support the podcast, you can always go to the online store and uh, buy some merch and get a nice, beautiful handwritten note uh, from Mike and maybe even a thread off of his wool leggings uh, that will be priceless one day. And uh, he might tape one of those to it. So it's not leg hair. It's a wool thread from his leggings. And he will weave those in there. If you need anything from him specifically, he's available, crushingiron at gmail.com. Or if you need anything from me, c26coach at gmail.com. All right. I guess I feel like I want to put uh, organ music behind the end of this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're feeling moved in the pulpit, we encourage you to walk down front, take a moment. Be silent with uh, with Pastor Mike and Reverend Robbie, and we will send you off into the week with all of your C26 crushing iron blessings. All right, let's do it, man. Yeah, see you at the potluck. All right, buddy, see you, man.